We gather in the Lord's house in this third Sunday of the resurrection. We gather to feel God's presence. We gather to worship a God that has done so much for us. We gather to reaffirm our faith and to put our lives in his hands each day. So brothers and sisters gathered here in the sanctuary, those that gather from afar, I say unto you all, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit dwell with each of you on this blessed Lord's Day. Brothers and sisters, let us begin our time of worship this morning with our song of praise. Let us arise in body or spirit. If members of the praise team would come forward, look to the screen above or turn to page 64 in your chorus book. Let us sing together, My life is in you, Lord. <laughs> Help us 
to commit our lives fuller to you and be better disciples and apostles of your holy word and of the resurrection message. O oh, Father, be with us now and send your spirit upon us in this time of worship together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first word of the Lord will come to us this morning from the Revelation of St. John, from the fifth chapter, verses 11 through 14 this morning. If you'd like to follow along with our first scripture reading, it's on page 1919 in the Pew Bible this morning. Our first scripture reminds us just how worthy Jesus was, how worthy he is of our blessing and our praise. He is the worthy Lamb of God who sacrificed for our salvation. He is the worthy Lamb of God that sits upon the throne, and he is the worthiest cause we could ever take out. This morning, Debbie will be reading the Holy Word. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living, cre living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The second word of the Lord this morning will come to us from the Gospel of St. John, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 19. If you would like to follow along with the Gospel Scripture this morning, it's on page 1687 in your pew Bible. You will hear in this Gospel Scripture this morning another appearance of Jesus as he is the resurrected Christ. He appears to the disciples on the beach. He gives Peter a great teaching and a call to the discipleship that should be heard, received, and utilized by each of us, his disciples, in this age. I ask that you arise in body or spirit as you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and remain standing then for our hymn of response. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, the founder from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, they got into their boat, and that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon heard him say it, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the risen Lord, the people of the risen Lord. Thanks be unto God. He says, follow him. He says, feed my sheep. We are called to be his disciples. It is the worthiest call of all time. He is worthy of all glory, all honor, and praise. Let us respond to the Lord of glory and to the word of the Lord of glory with our hymn of response this morning, number 533 in our red hymns, Jesus Calls Us. Jesus, our Savior. 
Amen. Be assured, brothers and sisters, by the blood of the Savior, the sins of the world are surely taken away. This season of resurrection is all about witnessing, about discipleship. Well, how do we witness? How do we bring a testimony of what God has done through the empty tomb? We do it through the gifts that God has given us. Yes, the treasures and the monies that we bring forth, they help to provide and spread that message. But even more so, it is our time and the gifts of the Spirit which dwell within us. As we bring our offerings forth this morning, how are you witnessing for Jesus Christ in these days of resurrection? How are you fighting off the darkness of the world with the light that has been placed within your heart? Let us bring our gifts unto the Lord.
just want to touch upon a few announcements this morning, and then we will go to our time of joys and concerns before we go together to the Lord in prayer this morning. A few announcements. This is a new month, so we have a new benevolence. Our benevolence for the month of May is Young Life, and I'm sure most of you have heard of Young Life and all the good work they do in the community. Uh, Debbie uh, helps out a lot, is on the Young Life board. Some of our youth in the church now are active in Young Life, and we've had youth go to camp and be active before. They're doing good work to do that thing called discipleship in our community to our younger population. Some of those kids that never get to church, some of those kids that didn't grow up maybe with a Bible in their house, now they're learning to love the Lord. So let us support Young Life well throughout the month of May. A reminder also, the green buckets are available over in the gathering room by the ramp entrance for all of our special mission offerings. Also, all of you that had orders from the Breezewood Trucker Traveler Ministry uh, pie and sandwich sale, those orders will be in this week, available for pickup on Wednesday in the gathering room from 10 a.m. to noon. So Wednesday in the gathering room from 10 a.m. to noon, your pie and sandwich orders will be here and delivered. Also, uh, this afternoon, um, if you have an open afternoon, at 2 o'clock out at the Old Woods Church, um, there will be a hymn sing and time of worship and celebration. And Doug Miller will bring you, be bringing the message and some special music. And Ruth Miller will also be playing and presenting some special music. So you're all invited to attend that at the Woods Church at 2 o'clock. We do have joys to share, too. I know our prayer list is long, and we will get to our prayer list. But there are a lot of joys in this spring season as we're seeing things take place that didn't take place as well in the last couple of years, and dances, and, and we saw Morgan, some pretty pictures last night of your dance, and we also saw, uh, I saw JJ was in the paper this week, and all of our youth and kids that participate in spring sports starting to see them active, and we're proud of all that they do. I know Sherm had a, a weightlifting meet at his house yesterday, and what was special about that is you had a lot of young guys there, and they were getting a good experience. Uh, they were getting good friendship, and a bit of discipleship is a little bit of sharing of love and faith, something that a lot of youth and kids do not get in our world today. So there are joys all around us. Another joy is some of the teams we have in our church, and I know I mention them from time to time, but our visitation team, our Stephen ministers, all of our cards that go out from our card ministry. So please be a part of those joys and, and sign a card before you leave today so we can send those out to our church members and friends in the community that are in need. It's also a joy to have the gift of prayer be able to come together and worship and to pray together and to share God together. And we do have many prayer concerns. As you look to that prayer list or your blue insert, I just want to touch upon a few you may be unaware of, a few that may be new this morning. We have a few in our congregation, an extended family that are recovering from surgeries. Um, Sydney Quick and Aiden Hill are both recovering from their surgeries. And we continue to pray for healing there, as well as Todd Smith, who had surgery this week. Continue to keep Todd in your prayers as he heals uh, from his surgery as well. We're keeping Caleb Rush in our prayers. Um, Caleb's had a really up and down the last couple of weeks. Um, he's had a lot of trouble breathing and issues with infection and, and just the daily living that we all take for granted. So please lift Caleb up in your prayers daily that there is some healing for him. Also, continue to keep Harriet Sotorokas in your prayers. Um, she was flown to Pittsburgh. Um, she had a tear in her heart. Um, she has been moved now to Homewood for rehab. Um, and we're just praying that the heart heals and, and that uh, Harriet heals while she is over there for rehab. We're also keeping uh, Dan's niece, uh, Nicole, um, and her brother Guy in prayers, and also their family at the loss of uh, Nicole's uh, young mother. Uh, sudden loss of her mother. And we are just keeping that whole family in our prayers down in Brazil. Also this morning, there was a tragic uh, accident in our community. Um, we're keeping the Fox family in our prayers. Um, an ATV accident with a young child. 
We're raising them up in prayers this morning. And continue to keep Marilyn Brown in your prayers. Uh, Marilyn um, was in the hospital, hospitalized, uh, heart issues. Uh, and just pray for healing for her. There are so many that are in need in our community. I know there's a lot that just aren't feeling well right now because of their allergies. A few of them are missing this morning. We just lift everyone up in prayer today. That they feel God's touch today. That, that they call upon Him in their time of need. So now, in our time of need, let us go to the Lord together in pray. Father God, no matter how we feel today, no matter what we are experiencing, we need you. We need to communicate with you. We need to have a relationship with you. We need to pray unto you. You are the great healer and the great redeemer. You walk with us in days of darkness. You walk with us in days of light. You are there in times of sorrow and in times of joy. Father, dwell within each heart that comes to you in prayer now. <coughs> Father, we lift up those we have mentioned, those on our prayer lists, those we do not know of, those that may be suffering from physical pain, those that are facing a new diagnosis, those that are in the hospital or in a rehab facility, those that face a mental illness, those that are depressed, anxious, alone on this day. Come into their lives. Father God, for those that are addicted, for those that are taken by the things of this world, bring relief and your light into their hearts. And Father God, for those that walk alone, those that live in darkness, may today be the day they find their way to you. Father God, help us to be better disciples and better witnesses in this season of resurrection. Knowing that Easter is not a one-day way of life, it's an everyday way of life. We must live as the resurrected, boldly witnessing, being a bold and courageous church for the name of the one, the perfect one, that was the worthy lamb of Calvary. Father God, build up our church here at St. John's, our denomination in the church universal, that it may follow his righteous ways, that it may do good unto all the world, and that it may fully live into the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we pray for those that live in the war-torn areas of Ukraine, those people of Ukraine and Europe that are suffering, Keep praying for peace and relief and know that true peace, true relief, true wholeness, true understanding only comes when all seek out and bow for you. Father God, we're thankful we live in this free nation, gifted with so much freedom, so much justice that others in the world, in the world do not experience. Others in the world just want to taste a little bit of that. Help us to be more thankful. Help us to live more unified. As we pray for those that protect us near and afar and ask that your shield be upon them always. As we pray for our leaders at all levels, we ask that they humble themselves and turn their hearts unto you when making every decision. And Father God, you are the one that transforms lives. Let your conversion happen to all that are lost, to all that seek to do evil, to all that walk down the wrong path. May all sinners' chains be broken. May we all stand in the grace of the risen Lord, Jesus, our brother, the one who taught us to pray unto you with the very words we use together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I ask that you look to your bulletin insert now for our time of communion together. Also, you will notice that the elements are in the pews in the main sanctuary. You'll find them on the right side of the hymnals. So take time to prepare your elements now as we prepare to attend the Lord's table together this morning. tradition, the Lord's table is open to all who believe and profess to have faith in Jesus Christ as the risen Lord. We know that is not true in every denomination, in every church. And we know there are many different ways that the gifts of this table are perceived throughout humanity. Some believe that until the priest or the reverend or the pastor prays upon the elements, they aren't truly changed because they believe they are transformed wholly into the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, not just the unleavened bread and the wine. They believe there has to be an intercessor between God and the people. We, of course, do not believe that. Others believe that the Spirit is in and around the bread and in and around the wine, and yes, it must be instituted again by a leader of the church. We do not believe that. In our tradition, we believe the mystery that surrounds the Holy Communion. We believe that the Spirit is here amongst us. He flows through me. If you're a believer, He flows through you as well. But there is a transformation. While we don't believe that this bread wholly becomes His body, or that this wine wholly becomes His blood, we do believe in the transforming power of the gifts of this table. We are transformed when we believe in the broken body. We are transformed when we believe in the shed blood. So you still should not come to this table lightly until you have accepted what that means. That this is the broken body. This is the shed blood because it already resides in you if you profess to believe. It's a transforming power. It's the greatest power that's ever been. It takes us from sin to life. It takes us from evil to good. It takes us from death to new life. Come, for all is good and fair. Let us pray. Father God, bless now the elements of thy kingdom. The unleavened bread, the symbol of the body broken. The wine, the symbol of the blood of the Savior shed for our sins. Consecrate these elements by the power of your Spirit. And may that Spirit flow through each believer who gathers here and who partakes from afar this morning. May all be blessed. May all be transformed in receiving these holy gifts. Let us say together our affirmation. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night of our Lord's betrayal, he gathered in the upper room with his brothers. They shared in that simple meal together. He took of the unleavened bread, and he broke it, and he passed it among his brothers. He told them to take and eat, for this was his body which shall be broken for them. They shared in that simple meal together as they had gathered in the old city for the Passover feast. And when the meal concluded, Jesus would take of the cup, certainly not a gold chalice, but perhaps a small clay jar. He would pass it among his brothers, he would bless it, and he would tell them to take and drink of this cup, for this is my blood which shall be poured out for you. After the meal had concluded, 
Jesus would instruct his brothers to do these things as often as they might in remembrance of him. Brothers and sisters, we do these things today in remembrance of our Lord and in the transforming power of his salvation. The body of Christ, broken for you, take and eat in his remembrance. Testament, the communion of the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink his remembrance. Brothers and sisters, join with me in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verses 1 through 20 this morning. If you'd like to follow along with this scripture, it can be found on page 1705 or 1706, depending on which pew Bible you are utilizing this morning. The Acts of the Apostles. From the ninth chapter, hear the word of our Lord this morning. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He had went to the high priest and he had asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. Now as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, speechless. They had heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into the city of Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. 
for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all, all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. Placing his hands upon Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Then at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word on this day. What a turn of events. What a conversion. What a mighty transformation the scripture reveals to us today in the man named Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle. What a change. What a difference having God in his life. What a difference believing in Jesus Christ accepting the broken body, the shed blood, would mean to this man, but also the history of the world. Remember, all through the glory and the power of God, the God whose same glory and the same power remains today, it is found within you and within me. Today's story is amazing. We're going to sing a song later, Amazing Grace. It describes how amazing this event is. It describes how amazing every event is when we find sight. And the sight is when we accept Jesus Christ. When we're no longer blinded by the ways of the world, but we accept that amazing grace, and we go through that amazing conversion that Paul went. we are changed. It's like Paul was in our story today. We're called to discipleship. Our earlier scriptures reminded us that. we're called to this time of transformation, this conversion, this new life that has been set before us, all caused by the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. No longer trapped by death and sin, we have been set free and set on a course of new life and new living and new being through Jesus, our Savior. And Jesus, who loves us and is with us in this very moment. The call to discipleship, the call to serving the one that is worthy, that worthy lamb that we heard about in John's scripture, in John's letter, the revelation this morning. He is worthy of all of our praise and all of our blessings and all that we do to bring the good news and his name and his love to the whole entire world. You see, the disciples, they're starting to experience this in these post-resurrection days. When 
Jesus would appear to the disciples as we heard about the story on the beach and would provide the fish for them to eat. This was the third appearance he had made. You remember, last week he appeared to Thomas, the doubter. And of course, on Resurrection Sunday, he had appeared to Mary Magdalene and the women first. Jesus was making his appearances known in these days of resurrection before he would ascend to the throne of heaven. He's making himself known today in the conversion story of Paul. A changed man who would change history. Do you feel through your belief and your trust in Jesus Christ today that you are a changed woman, a changed man, a changed human being? Because if you don't, then you're really missing something. You're really missing out on the greatest gift in life, in accepting the new life God has given you. But let's go to our main character in today's story, the Paul. We've already heard that Mary Magdalene and, and the women, of course, they were doubting and having fears, but, and they're in all of the empty tomb. We've heard from Thomas. Thomas was the doubter. He didn't believe it till he saw it. That he was a witness to the glory of the resurrection. And today we find ourselves with a man named Saul. Saul of Tarsus. How is Saul different than these other people? Well, the disciples were of no means and wealth or power. And certainly Mary Magdalene and the women that first got to the tomb were of no means, money, power, or influence. But now we have Saul of Tarsus. Saul is a Roman citizen. Saul is an intelligent man. And Saul has also made it his goal at this point in his life to chase down anyone who believed in the way, as the scripture describes it. And that's right, the way. The only way to live, the only way to do life, the only way to redemption. And the way is believing in the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's what you belong to today if you accept that he's your Savior. You're part of the way. And Paul was going to persecute anyone who believed in the way, men or women, wherever they were from. He had now gone to get letters so he could go into Damascus chase down these new believers, these people that follow this cult leader named Jesus, who supposedly arose from the dead. Paul is going to chase him down. Paul's a man of power. Paul is a man on a mission. But Paul is going in all the wrong direction. He's going down the tracks that have the end that goes off the cliff and into the abyss. But he doesn't know it. Paul is headed into darkness, but he doesn't recognize it. And we say that about ourselves sometimes. We get on the wrong track. We go the wrong way. And certainly those that are lost in the world and do not accept Jesus Christ and his resurrection, they're on the wrong path and they're on the wrong way. And the destination they get to is not one to be desired. But today, Paul will change course in our story. In every moment of our lives, we have that opportunity, if we're not already believers, to change our course. And if we are believers, to strengthen our course, which is headed to new life, to heaven, to redemption, that comes through Jesus Christ. But as Paul is on his way, he is struck down by the light that surrounds him. He is stopped in his tracks and on his mission. Transformation is about to take place. Have you ever experienced something in your life you think everything's going a certain way you want it to go this way, or maybe it's going totally wrong and all of a sudden it changes course? That's how Paul had to feel in this moment. You got to think Paul was a pretty confident man. And if you read the letters and epistles of Paul, you'll find he's pretty confident in himself in the way he writes to the churches. But at least when he has that confidence, he has the Holy Spirit. On this day, his confidence was built upon the ways of man, the ways of the world. And God was about to strike that down in a mighty way. As 
Paul falls down upon the road. He doesn't know what's happening. A voice calls out, Saul, Saul, why? Why do you persecute me? That same voice calls out to the world today. World, world, why do you persecute me? World, world, why do you not accept me? World, world, why do you turn away from me? That same voice comes from a God that loves us, a God that seeks us out, a God that wants to redeem all of his creation. A God that had blinded Paul on the road to Damascus, a God that was going to change his life. It was the Lord Jesus who was speaking now to Paul. Why, Paul? Why do you persecute? The men that were gathered there, I can only imagine. They could hear the voices. They could not really see what was going on. They're confused. But Jesus tells Paul, get up. Go on to Damascus. He gives them instructions to wait there until someone will come to him. Now Paul is blind physically. A big change has to be led the rest of the way into the city of Damascus. <coughs> but you see, the story's not done for Paul, because as God often does, he takes those that we see in biblical stories that seem lost, that seem helpless, that seem to be going down the wrong path, and he completely changes them. He doesn't just eliminate them. He turns them around. That's what he's about to do for Paul. For Saul, who becomes Paul. Look at this image. This is an artist's rendition of Ananias praying over Paul. Ananias, when Paul gets into the city, gets those instructions from the Lord where to go to find Paul and to pray over him. Ananias is a believer. A believer in the way. He's going to go and he's going to pray via the Lord's instructions for Paul, Saul, who becomes Paul. He's going to pray for him and the scales are going to fall. What are those scales that fall from Paul's eyes that give him sight? Not just physical sight, but new life. They're the same scales that fall from our eyes. The scales of sin, the scales of darkness, the scales of worldly things. Those scales were falling off your eyes when you accepted Jesus Christ, when you were transformed. That sin was taken away and conquered, but we still commit more sin. And sometimes we like to try to build those scales back up. How often do we try to blind ourselves to the ways of God? How often do we fill ourselves with the things of this world and start to build up those scales again? How often have we walked away from God or maybe not put our whole heart into it? How much strength does our relationship need today? Because the transformation of us is not just in that moment when we accept Him. Yes, that's when the new life begins. But that is how you live that new life. Do you let the transformation continue to grow? Do you let the power of God to continue to, sa to sanctify every part of your being the rest of your life? Or do you block God out? Do you turn away from Him? Or do you seek a better relationship all the time? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to put more scales. We're going to blind ourselves with the ways of the world. We're going to do it in ways today we may not even recognize. But when we go to God for forgiveness, when we reach out to Jesus Christ in prayer, we are forgiven. More scales fall away. And because of his broken body and his shed blood, we can never put enough scales back up to completely blind us from God. He will get through if we accept him. He will give us sight, and he will give us new life and new purpose every day. He will transform us in every moment if we let him. 
into a new creation filled with the gifts of the Spirit, enabled to do miraculous and great things for this world. But people, we got to let the scales fall away. we got to see him clearly. we got to let him live in our hearts today. Now see, we can see ourselves in Mary Magdalene, afraid. We can see ourselves in the disciples, afraid. We can see ourselves in Thomas, the doubter, in Peter, the denier, even in Judas, the betrayer. We can see ourselves. We can see ourselves in Paul, too. Because even as believers, even if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have persecuted someone in your life. How do we persecute people as believers? We persecute the way they worship, how righteous they might be, how loud they are, about Jesus. Maybe how they live their life. Well, we're all good at judging others and how they live. Yet none of us has the right to. That's how we persecute in the modern age. We persecute those that are outside the church that we think may not be worthy or we can never bring in. We pure persecute others when we don't reach out to them. That's how we become persecutors like Paul. And we all have gone down the wrong track a time or two, and we have all been persecutors, but guess what? We all have been given the chance of new life and true transformation. And so we can also see ourselves in who Saul would become, Paul the Apostle. And likewise, we can see ourselves in Ananias, the minor character in today's story. Ananias is a believer. He believes in this new way, but he is hesitant to listen to what Jesus is asking. He's heard how treacherous and murderous this guy named Saul is. He doesn't want any part of him, and he certainly doesn't want to help him when he comes into the city because he fears he's going to persecute people there, put them to death in the name of Jesus. And Ananias thinks, how can this be so, Lord? How can this be so? Never test the power and the will and the purpose of our God. Ananias will follow the command, and those scales will fall off of the face of Saul. He will be changed. You know how sometimes we don't want to do what the Lord's asking us? We can feel a fooling. Those are our Ananias moments. So we can see ourselves in all of these people, and we certainly need to see ourselves in who Saul becomes, the transformed man, the transformed messenger, an apostle for the gospel. <laughs> the Lord reminds Ananias what he will do to Paul. Paul is his chosen instrument to bring his message to many before the Gentiles and their kings and to Israel as well. We heard about Peter today in the Gospel of John. Jesus speaking to Peter on the beach was him trying to teach Peter how much he needed to love the people of the world. And he was also predicting to Peter what the cost would be of serving him and being the rock of the church. That cost would be Peter crucified, like Jesus, only upside down. That's the cost he would pay. We learn right off that Paul is going to have to pay the price to be the instrument that tells of God's grace to the world. And Paul will pay that price. Paul will have a thorn upon him the rest of his life. He will suffer for the Lord. In all the power and glory God gives him, he still will be persecuted. He will be beaten. He will be in prison. And ultimately, he will receive the gift of a Roman execution as a Roman citizen by losing his head. Paul, though, would change the world. Why? Because it says in Scripture, after he gains his sight back is when he truly sees things spiritually. Why? Because he receives the Holy Spirit. Now the truth of God is upon him. It's within his soul, within his heart, in his mind. And the truth will be upon his lips in all that he does because the last line of Scripture is the most important. Once transformed, Paul doesn't sit on his laurels. 
Paul doesn't trace back to Jerusalem. Paul goes into all the synagogues, declaring that Jesus is the Son of God, declaring that he is the resurrected Lord. Not only does Paul do that, he follows the one way, the right way. He doesn't just preach the word, he writes the word and gives us most of the New Testament that we cherish after the Gospels. Most of the instructions that the church follows today come from his lips. You don't understand how much of his teaching influences what we do in the church and what we believe. This man would travel throughout Asia Minor and Europe, making trips that seem amazing at that time against all odds, and certainly not on his own accord, but given the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit that resided within him. But even though that spirit was within him, even though he had been transformed, Paul had to make the decision to accept it and do something with it. I pray that because you're sitting in this room or watching from afar today, that most of you have accepted what Jesus did. The question is, what have you and what will you and what will we do about it? The Spirit didn't just go away when Christianity became the biggest religion in the world. Although it would have never got there without Paul empowered with the Holy Spirit. You realize Christianity would have died out in Jerusalem without the transformation that happened to this man. Christianity will die out in this century if people like you and me don't take it to the world. If we don't lift up others. If we don't seek to end judgment and persecution. If we don't declare Jesus to all nations. Jesus will still come again. Believers will still be taken to heaven forever and ever. But how many in the world will be lost if we don't live out the transformation that God has let happen when I and you said we believe? How have you been transformed? What scales are blocking your eyes this morning? And are you truly following the one way that matters? Not just to your life, but to the life all creation. Let us pray. Father God, as we go forth this morning, as we live in these weeks of the resurrection, help us to bear witness. Help us to bring the transforming message of Jesus to all of our brothers and sisters, and truly help us to live into the gifts of the Spirit. We can see what the gifts would do for the Apostle Paul and for the disciples. The Spirit is alive and well today, and we need to use it to bring the message of hope and the message of Jesus unto all in this hurting world. Bless us and enable us to do so like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing that hymn that reminds us of the transforming power, the transforming gift we have all been given. The gift that was given to Saul, who became Paul. Maybe you didn't get a new name when you started believing. But believe me, you became a new person, and a new life. The day you decided to say, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Now what do you do with that belief? And how do you take his grace unto all the world? I ask that those that are in need of special prayer and anointing, please come forward during our last hymn. And let us arise and sing unto the Lord, our hymn of sending and transformation. Number 299 in your red hymns, Amazing Grace.
Now what do we do? That we have been found in the grace of Jesus. What do we do? How do we spread that message? Where do we take it? We spread it with the power of the Spirit. We take it unto all the world, knowing we have the backing of the Almighty God, knowing that Jesus Christ holds our hand all along the way, and knowing that the power of the Spirit shall reign, the power of the resurrection shall reign over death and destruction. And knowing, always knowing, that grace will lead us home. Let us pray. Father God, send forth your people in the wisdom of the resurrection. Jesus, our brother, go with us now in your love and grace eternal. And, O oh, Spirit, guide us and dwell within us like never before. Transform us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, so all thy world may know thy grace. Amen. Thank you.